If I ever make a wrong turn, which has not happened yet, but if I do, it's because we're on an adventure. How many of you have seen the, it's a, I don't know if it's Subaru or what, it's a car commercial. And the family is driving across the country. And while they're in the car, they're in this beautiful, picturesque mountain scenery, and, and you can overhear her aunt on the other end. Oh, my, what are you doing? You're driving? How boring. You've got the kids with you. Now, me and your uncle, we like to fly wherever we go. That way we can get in quicker, and we can just get back down into our hotel and start watching TV. <laughs> yeah. And while they're doing that, this family is driving through this beautiful mountain vista, and they actually have to slow down so a moose can walk in front of them. And the kids are in the back going, cool. And, the, and the, the niece on the phone says, I don't know. I guess we just enjoy driving. We just enjoy the journey. You know, and as one, I, I have to admit if I had a lot more money, I would do a lot more traveling. I love to see new places. I love to see new things. I love the mountains. I love the beaches. I, I love seeing new people and new places and wondering, what is your life like here? What is it like to be there? I love being on an adventure. And uh, what I want to say to each and every one of us, whether you want to or not, you are on the adventure of a lifetime. And some people think it's bad news, but I'm going to tell you it's good news because the God who created the heavens and the universe is the same God who calls out to us now, the same one who sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we can lean into the abundant life of Jesus Christ. And, and so last week... Um, uh, we, we, we really started, I know Robert kind of did his own thing last week, which I gave him permission to do his own thing, um, but we, we are started with any time you're going on a trip, all right, now some of you will connect with this, any time you're on a, going on a trip, you usually have to know where you're going. Uh, remember Alice in Wonderland, you know, well, which way do I go? He says, depends, where do you want to go? And she says, it really doesn't matter. Then he says that it doesn't matter which way you go. If you don't know your destination, then it really doesn't matter which way you go. And many people are just wandering through life. How many of you have left home to find yourself somewhere else, you know? Many, many people did that. I don't know if they do that now. They did that in the 60s. That's what they did. They left home so I can find myself because it's not in this podunk little town. That's what we know. We've seen everything there is to see here. And they strike out to find about life and about themselves and about the journey. Well, we as Christians, we know. We know where we want to end up and, and the destination. So when you're planning a trip, when you're planning an adventure, you have to know where you want to end up if you want to make sure that you get there. And so we talk about the destination. What is our destination? Where do we want to go? Where do we want to end up? Heaven. Heaven. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. And so the question that we're going to answer today is how do we get there? Now, how many of you remember the old days where you were planning a trip, and um, my kids are up here in the front here, they have no idea what we're talking about. There was this group called Triple A, and they had an office, and whenever you wanted to go somewhere, you, you had to go down, and you'd have somebody help you and say, well, where do you want to go, and you'd tell them, and they would help you with the destination, and then they would give you a, a tick trip, right? They, they would design it so turn by turn, you would know where you're going, where you're supposed to be, where the next turn is, and you, or, or how many of you used to keep 100 yellow highlighters at your house because you would get out that same old map of the southeastern United States and it's been folded up many different times. How many of you have ever been able to fold it back the same way it started? All right, a couple of you. God bless you. Mine never worked that way. And so I would start folding it this way and this way and then finally just crumple it up, throw it in the back seat. Or... It, it, they would get so old because I never would want to stop and I'd never want to get a new one. So I just keep using the same old one and just highlight a new route. I want to go this way this time. I want to do this, this. Or the road that you need is right in the middle of one of those little creases and it's torn and it's worn and it's frayed and you can't see it anymore. That's the way that we used to do it. 
And then about, uh, what, about 15 years ago, they came out with GPS. How many of you remember the early GPS systems? Yes, yes. Well, somebody had given one to us because we couldn't afford to buy one, but they gave us their old one. And so we plugged it in in our car, and we kind of lived off back in a, a neighborhood subdivision somewhere. And I just thought, this is really cool. You can plug in. You want to find restaurants? It'll find restaurants. You want a direction? It'll find direction. It'll even find the closest gas station. But there were some flaws with the old system because as we were driving close to our home, I put in just for fun, where's the closest gas station? The closest gas station was two miles away. The problem was there wasn't a road. You can't get there from here. And in order to get to that gas station, which was only two miles away, you had to drive 15 miles around the world to, to get there. And so GPSs, you know, they kind of had their issues. Um, my son was with us. We were on a family uh, trip. We were in the mountains, and we had this GPS and we're trying to follow it. We had never been, our friends had loaned us their mountain cabin. We're going to be able to stay in there. But it was late. We hadn't had dinner yet. We're going to ride into the next town. Uh, but we don't know how to get there. And so we just plug in the trusty GPS. And um, the first thing that happened was the lady. And she's a very nice lady. I don't mean to speak ill of her. But she would say, turn right now. And I'm like, I can't turn right turn, and then she gets a little frustrated with you, turn right now. I'm like, I'm screaming at this little box going, there's a mountain. There's, there, there is no right. There's no way to go up it. And, and, and then she gets exasperated with you and says, oh, recalculating, right? <laughs> recalculating. And, and, and then we went, we were following it one time and it brought us down to the darkest, scariest road. We came up to a fence that said, go any farther and you will die. <laughs> she says, keep going for four miles. I'm like, ain't happening, lady. I don't know who you are, but you obviously don't know any more different than I know. I'm turning around. <sighs> Recalculating recalculating. Well, today the GPS system is much improved. There are even travel programs now that are travel in real time. You can see everything that's going on. For some of you, some of you don't have this yet, and so now you need to know it because it will tell you when there's a cop ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll tell you if there's construction ahead. It'll tell you if there's an accident ahead. And, and so you're traveling in real time, and you know the fastest way is this way, but you know if there's a cop or an accident, it's going to go slower than you think it is. So let's take the country road. Recalculating. But it, it's so much better today. And, and how this works is there are eyewitnesses. Woo, going somewhere. Taking a turn. Keep up. There are eyewitnesses who have gone before. And they're sending information to those who are following. And they're telling us about all the things along the way that we need to watch out for. And they're telling us the best way for us to go. We learn from their experiences. Well, today I want to talk to you today about a system that never fails. It has never failed. It will never fail. It's tried and true, and it's written by eyewitnesses who took the time to write it down and share their experiences. It's another kind of GPS. In, instead of a global positioning system, it is God's positioning system. It's God's mapping. It's God's GPS what is that GPS? The Holy Scriptures. It's the Bible. You know, so many of the young people today say, well, you know, why do you think that? Why do you believe that? And the answer from the old people is, well, because the Bible tells me so. That's why. But they have no frame of reference, no, no understanding or appreciation. And they go, so what? 
just because some book tells you that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to follow, and we old people who say, uh, yeah, that's right. But we need to help them to understand. It, it's not just some cleverly written book from a long time ago. It is written by people who were there. People who saw, witnessed things that were incredible. And they're probably writing it down going, I'm going to write it down. But unless you were there, you're going to find this really hard to believe. In our passage today, we're going to be following along in 2 Peter. In our passage today, Peter is writing to the early church. And this is, yes, the Peter who was the disciple, the, the Peter who walked on water with Jesus, the Peter who even, yes, even denied Christ at one point when he swore he wouldn't, he would even go to the death. And yet this is later. And he's writing down his experiences. Peter, a friend and an eyewitness to Jesus, realizes his life is coming to an end. You see, not only were they an oratorical society, which means they, they passed things down by word of mouth. They didn't have the printing press back then. They didn't have a copy of the Bible for everyone. And, and, and so they would, they would write these things down. But I, I think they didn't write them down for a long time. Many of these books weren't written uh, until uh, 20, 30, 40 years after Jesus. Now, they had been teaching for 20, 30, 40 years about Jesus, but they had never really written it down. And I believe the reason is, is because they expected Jesus to come back. And then I think it occurred to them, you know, maybe he's not coming back in our lifetime. And so we want to leave you an orderly account. We want to write you so that you will know that you will remember, that you will understand. Peter writes to the church, he says, uh, he encourages the church, it is good to refresh your memories while I am still here. But it's also written, account to encourage you after I'm gone. Our passage this evening comes from Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. It's entitled, The Prophecy of Scripture. And so I will always remind you of these things. This is Peter talking and writing to the church. I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth. How do they know them? Because he's been teaching them for many, many years. And are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory. As long as I live in the tent of this body which means a temporary dwelling. That's why they call it a tent, right? We weren't ever meant to live in this forever. Verse 14. Because I know that I will soon put it aside. There's an old man writing back saying, I'm going to die soon. As our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, after my death, you will always be able to remember these things. We did not follow cleverly invented stories. Do you know what the original sin was? Not, not just about Adam and Eve in the garden. The original sin was Eve's breach of trust. And you know what's happened ever since then? I believe Satan has gotten into people's minds and saying, can you really trust the Bible? Can you trust the Word? This was just written by man. It wasn't written by God. It was written by man. It's not trustworthy. Peter answers them. Again, verse 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses. If you have your Bibles, underline, highlight, eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received honor and glory from God the Father. When the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son with whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it 
as to a light shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. And I want to remind you, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So many people today say, do I have to read the Old Testament? And the answer is, yeah, you do. That was the only Bible they had back then. And and Peter is saying, listen to these prophets. These are not cleverly invented stories, but these will tell you and lead you into understanding what I'm trying to tell you about about Jesus Christ. And and, and so he, he said, 19, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right. So... You see what he's saying? He, he's answering these arguments that are still going on today. Is the Bible really the inspired word of God? He said, yeah. They're not cleverly invented stories. They were inspired by God, written down by man. And, and when you begin to get one book, two book, three book, 66 books all coming together that, that over written over thousands of years that actually come together and tell one consistent story. You know, somebody tells you something, you, and depending on who it is, somebody tells you something, you go, okay. But if, if somebody else comes along and tells you the same thing, you go, Okay. Then somebody tells you again, you go, oh, okay. What we have here is a conglomeration of inspired and eyewitness authors and writers who were writing down what they know to be true. I love this passage from Peter. You can see his heart writing into this. He is an eyewitness who had walked with Jesus and, yes, even denied him, only to be later redeemed by the resurrected Jesus. I want to ask you a question. If you know this story about Peter, Peter was walking with Jesus. Jesus told him that he was going to have to suffer and die, that he was going to be crucified. And Peter, excuse me, Peter said, no, you're not far be it, Lord, we, we, we can't have that. And yet when they came for Jesus, he was shocked. And he was watching from a distance, and Jesus had prophesied that he would deny him. He says, not even if they have to kill me, I won't deny you. And what happened? Not once, not twice, three times. And then the cock crowed. And it was a reminder of the prophecy of Jesus that said, you will do this. He ran away in shame. Christ was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. The faith of the disciples was shattered. How can the Son of God die? How can the... That's not the plan. And yet, he was one of the first ones. When he was told that the tomb was empty, he ran. He ran to say, I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. And then if you know the story, then just a short time later, he went back to his old job. He went back to fishing. But then he sees the resurrected Jesus standing on the bank, calling out to him. Peter says, it's the Lord. He dives into the water, swims as fast as he can, and embraces his Lord and Savior who looks him in the eye and says, Peter, do you love me? Oh, yeah. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. He denied Christ three times. Three times Christ restored him. Here's the cool thing. Much of the Bible is written by eyewitnesses. (laughs) We sang just a few moments ago, isn't it cool? And they all kind of lined up together. Can I get a witness? 
you know, this true, this new uh, travel program. Um, how many of you have ever used Waze before? Yeah, many of you have. And it gives updates in real time. How many of you trust it? The ones who use it, right? Why do you trust it? Because you have followed it before. When it says there's a cop, you start looking, you'll find a cop. When it says there's an accident up ahead, you keep looking, you're going to find an accident. So what happens later? Next time you're going on a trip and you tune into ways and it says, don't go the way that you think you want to go. Go another way. What do we do? We go the other way. Why? Because we have learned to trust in these eyewitnesses. The Bible is written by eyewitnesses. This isn't just some book. Peter talks about it. Peter says, I know what some of you are thinking. The Bible is just some clever story written down by man. John, the disciple, tells us in his book, Jesus did all these things and there's not enough books in all the world to hold all the things that he did. But these things are written so that you might know and believe. Peter tells us these things are written down so you will know and you will believe that you might know the way to heaven. A couple of weeks ago, um, I want you to know that the bishop cares about this church. Okay? I think that's important for you to know. Uh, we are in uncertain times. And, and he called several of us together, of which I was a representative from our church that was invited to come. And he said, you know, we're in uncertain times. What are we to do? How are you as pastors supposed to lead churches through these uncertain times? He says, go back to what you're supposed to do. Go back to your first love. Go back to making disciples of Jesus Christ. We don't know what's going to happen, but I want you to hear this. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be just fine. I believe in whatever way, whatever fashion, the Methodist church is going to be just fine. I want you to hear that this church is going to be just fine. We're going to keep moving and growing and doing exactly what we need to do, and that is making disciples of Jesus Christ. How are we going to do that? Well, we have our cornerstones. Uh, and, and the cornerstones aren't for the Methodist church. The cornerstones are for Christians who say, how do I get there? How do I know the way? Connect, grow, serve, and share. And our grow team is the way that we help people grow in their faith through discipleship. How do we grow in discipleship? We get into God's word. It is trustworthy it is true, worthy of teaching us everything we need to know about salvation, about sanctification, and the way to heaven. John Wesley said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. Give me that book, meaning the one that teaches us how to get to heaven. Give me that book at any price. Give me that book. I want to know the way to heaven. So I want to ask you this evening, do you know God's word? Do you trust it to take you where you want to go? I want to encourage you to take the time to get to know God's plan of salvation, to hide it in your heart. Many times we come up against temptations, we come up against challenges, and I want to remind you about Jesus being in the desert Every time Satan came to him, he always misquoted Scripture. He twisted it around. Jesus always came back with a direct quote, accurately, in context, from Scripture. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You can know. You can know the way. And you can trust so that when you get to know God's Word, when you hide it in your heart, then you too can come to the saving faith, this knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you can also be a witness.